Yeah, so um, continuing with uh, the talks track at MiniHack 2020, we have our second speaker for today, uh, which is Joachim Breitner. Uh, Joachim has been a long-term guest at MuniHack and also has been a speaker previously at MuniHack uh, Muni 2019. Uh, Joachim uh, looks back to a long history of Haskell involvement. He started 15 years ago, 2007, at a hackathon, a Haskell hackathon in Freiburg, where he just, uh, well, uh, he was there like people at the beginners workshop here and uh, was completely new to Haskell and uh, liked the language and the people. And so he got involved in the community. Uh, he first got uh, started with Xmonad and then later on uh, also in GHC, the Haskell compiler, where he now is a member of the GHC steering committee. Uh, by the way, the GHC steering committee is looking for additional members. So if you're interested, then please approach Joachim. Um, yeah, also Joachim is hosting a blog. It's at joachimbreitner.de. Dot de uh, in, in English, yeah. <laughs> Switching languages in the middle, middle of the sentence. Um, yeah, uh, so he might be known to some of you also via that. Uh, this particular talk is actually, it's the first time uh, Joachim is actually talking about this. It's a new idea on uh, how to make Haskell even more declarative. The library is called uh, RecDef and I think uh, Joachim wants to be, uh, to, uh, to be described as one weird trick to make Haskell even more declarative. So thank you, Joachim, and enjoy. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's great to be speaking at Munich again and in, in person. So it's much more fun than, uh, than online. Right, so I want to talk about um, something about recursive definitions and equations in Haskell. And it all kind of resolves around this concept of laziness. So Haskell is um, the, the unique selling, or one of the unique selling points of Haskell is it's pure and lazy, and that's something you don't find in many other languages. Um, and, and laziness is great until it isn't. And when it isn't, then we have to do something else, or we have to apply weird tricks like the ones I'm going to show now. Um, so we'll look at that. Um, and we'll look at how the trick works internally a little bit, and then we can have a discussion, which is actually one of the reasons why I'm giving this talk, on a here, do you still consider this to be what you expect from Haskell, or is this like too nasty and too mean and, and, and not good? So that's the rough agenda. Um, so let's start looking at laziness. Um, who of you have heard the term tying the knot in the context of Haskell before? Okay, that's most of you, that, that's good. Um, tying the knot is basically writing something recursive. Now, you have recursion in other languages, like in, in um, C and Python, as long as it's functions that are recursive. You can have two functions, and they can both call each other, and that's fine, and it kind of works. Um, and fundamentally, the reason that works is that even in those languages that we don't consider to be lazy, functions are, in, in some sense, lazy. You define a function. At this point, nothing happens yet. And only when, once you call the function, that's when the body of the function gets executed. And that's a, one way of laziness. And that is the reason why those languages that don't have laziness in the sense that we have, you know from Haskell uh, have recursion, but only between functions, because that's the only thing that's lazy. At least one could see it that way. And Haskell is more lazy. It's not just functions that are lazy, but basically everything that can is lazy. Uh, for example, data structures. So one poster child for laziness and, and recursion and tying the knot in Haskell is this definition of the, of the list of Fibonacci numbers. So just say the list of Fibonacci numbers is zero and then one, and then I continue with some computation using list functions that you know, and I've, I'm actually using the thing that I'm defining in its own equation. That's recursion. If this was just functions, it wouldn't be too strange, but this is a data type, a, a data structure that refers to itself. And that works in Haskell because we can start using the data structure even before it is fully known. So this is a typical example for laziness and for tying the knot where we have um, a data structure that refers to itself in some interesting way. But the example I want to walk through now initially or first 
is something else. Um, it is a programming puzzle from like graph algorithms. So I can define a graph data structure. So let's switch to coding. Um, a graph, is, is this big enough? The last row is happy? Okay. Um, a graph data structure we just represent as a map from numbers representing the nodes in my graph to the successive uh, nodes in that graph. So for example, this would be as an example graph with three nodes, one, two, and three, and one points to three, and two points to one, and to three, and three points nowhere. So a simple graph. And my challenge now, or my task, is to write uh, a function that takes the graph and calculates its reflexive transitive closure, or in, in less mathy terms, from any node, which other nodes can I reach in that graph? And that's something you will encounter often, for example, when implementing game stuff, uh, game logics, for example, or basically graphs are everywhere. So this is a, a very important problem to solve. So let's see, how can we solve this? Um, well, you can already hit, see a hint. I'm going to use the set data structure as well. So maybe let's, let's try to define a map from um, nodes to all the other nodes it can reach, which is roughly what we want to do. So once we have that, that we can turn it into a, one of these graphs very easily. We just turn these sets to lists, and we would be done. So how do we, can we define this thing? Um, so we need to have a map from each node to something, and our graph is a map from every node to something. So we maybe let's look at all the nodes there. So we can use the map uh, map with keys operation. Um, and just because it's, oh, I'm going to use a helper function here because otherwise we run out of horizontal space here. Um, so this is a function that, which takes a node. It also takes the list of successive nodes. That's what map with key does. And it should return something that can, f well, it should return a set, the set of all reachable nodes. So what nodes are reachable from V? Certainly V itself is reachable from V. And then I have to look at all the successive, all the successor nodes. Um, and let's use a little list comprehension here. So for all node, that is reachable directly from V, well, everything that's reachable from a node that's reachable from V is also reachable from V. So here I can, I, I, what do I want here? I want, I want to have all the nodes reachable from V prime. Well, but ideally, this set state structure will contain that information. So let's just look it up there. And then we have a list of sets, so we just um, union that, and that seems to type check. So Obviously, it's correct, right? Now we can try it out. Here's GHGI. Uh, I have okay. So it seems to be doing something, and the result looks reasonable. From node number one, I can reach one and three. From node number two, I can reach one and two and three, and from node number three, I can reach three. So that that's that's good, right? Yeah. Um, I went back and forth. I think uh, it, I didn't want to have the two list here. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. Like um, I, I like list comprehensions whenever I can use them. So I wanted to have the map list somewhere. That's not crucial at this point. Um, right. So and just in case people haven't like played with this recursive definition laziness multiplying thing a lot, I'm going to walk through a little bit what happens here. So this is the code that I just wrote, um, more or less. Um, and, and now I'm going to be evaluating that on the slides, just by doing simple transformation steps, replacing equals with equals. So for example, I'll start by inlining that function in, in our result here. So the graph number one becomes the G here. So we can rewrite it like this. So this is just the function definition, but now G is a concrete value. Now this G only appears here, so we can um, inline it there, and we just keep simplifying the whole program. So we run map with keys on a on a map that is kind of manifest already. So we can move the function call f into the map. That's something that map with key does. So now we have the function call f as the values in the map. 
And in the next step, I'm doing something that, that's kind of crucial here. So the, this expression here, I can give it a name. And, and that, that's the, the essence of laziness. You, you give names to things, and then you just deal with, you continue with the names. So I call these S1, S2, and S3, and these are the elements of the map. Um, and, and this preserves the meaning of the program, because that's what purity is all about. It doesn't matter whether I, I use S or F1 list of three in this place, it would be the same thing. So this did not change the program, and I can continue like this. Now I can move the function f and f inside here, just a simple inlining of that function. Um, we have the list comprehension on the right, we can replace that by just simple lists. So now we have well, uh, yeah, these lists here. Um, and, and now we can kind of see what happens with laziness. So this map data structure here, is a very manifest map. It's completely there. It has all the three elements there. Um, and, but the values happen to be these complex expressions. But that is in no way a problem for looking up the third element in that map. Because I can look at that map and, okay, the third element, or number, entry number three, that's S3. So I can replace this thing here with S3. And same here, S1 and S2. And this is roughly what's happening when you run the program. Well, very roughly, but it, it is a valid way of thinking about laziness and, and evaluation. And suddenly, all the recursion is gone. Which means we were able to make progress through this data structure and come back with something that you could have just written in a non-recursive, uh, sorry, non-lazy language, because now S1 just refers to S3, S3 to, well, S2 refers to S1 and S3, and there's no cycle involved anymore. And we can now finish evaluating the program, and, and we get the result that we see. So far, so good. This is laziness. This is how you impress beginners about Haskell. Because how else could you implement the transitive closure of a graph that elegantly? I mean, imagine what you have to do in another language. You have to have, like, have a loop and keep track of where you've been and, and, and all these things, and it's a very imperative. So are we happy? Can we just have dessert now, or is there a problem? This is where the part where you get active and uh, answer questions. Oh, what about cyclic graphs? You are very mean. You you break you break Haskell. It's no longer as great as it looked. Okay, let's make this graph cyclic. Let's add an edge from one to two. Now we have one goes to two and three. Two goes to one and also three. So what will happen if I run transitive on this thing? It, it did something. It found that the resulting graph certainly has node number one, so that's good. But it doesn't know which other things are reachable from number one, because it's running in a circle. That's bad. We have a, a simple problem. We have an elegant solution. It's very declaratively. It, 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 it's the code you want to write. And it breaks down once the problem becomes a little bit more complicated. And, and this is disappointing, because what can you do now? I mean, really, the, the only option is, okay, laziness, not tying is cute, and you can make fun talks about it, but it's not really useful in practice because you run into this problem. So now I have to rewrite my program using like this imperative style. We have a local Go function, and it has an argument that keeps track of all the nodes you've seen, and you keep track of... And I mean, Most of you might have written code like this before, like the... The where go scene idiom is quite common. And that's bad. That's annoying. That's, I want to have this. And here I claim we can have that. And so let's see. Okay, I guess if uh, to see what goes wrong, um, if, if you add this extra edge here and we do the whole stepping through is at this point, it, this is no longer about the map. We, we could look through the map just fine. So this is the step where we kind of that that not has been has disappeared, but we now have a set of recursive equations, and I could have written them directly and run the same problem, where now S2 refers to S1 and S1 and refers to S2. And this doesn't work because these functions I'm using here, they are too strict. So the insert and unions, they need their argument before they can produce a result. Whereas the map data structure doesn't need the argument before it can produce a result. So that's 
that's why these kind of equations will not make progress in Haskell. Okay, um, so this doesn't work, but I claim it could. So this, this is the part of the API for data set. Oh, remember that the problem is not with map, it's with, it's with set. The map data type did what it had to do for our, our use case. So this is the API that uh, we use from set. And I created a library, it's called RecDev, and you can find it on Hackett. And let's start just using the library. So we don't, we don't look initially how it works underneath. And it provides a data type that has a very similar API. Same insert, same union, same structure. And then there's also a way of getting the normal set out of it. So let's try to use that in our code. Um, so I have to fix a few things. Um, well, I'm going to be using. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm going to be using the RS operations here. I have to update the type signature. And then, of course, at the end, before I can use S to list, I have to get the underlying thing out. That's it. It's type checks again. So we're happy, right? <laughs> okay. Um, does it still work in craft number one? It still works in craft number two. And now, drum roll. It works in Graph 2 as well. That's great, isn't it? I guess, um, yeah, I was told I have 45 minutes, so um, I guess I can't just stop now, right? Um, OK. So this worked. Um, just to show that this idiom is not just this particular graph example, let's, let's do another example where we run into the same problem and we find that um, we want to, well, um, we want to have it nicer. So let's start with a program analysis example. Um, this is like you write a compiler, you have a language, you, have, you compile, you pass a language into an abstract syntax tree like this. This is really what you find in a, in a, in a typical example programming language course. Or when you look at GHG itself, because it has a data structure like this, and what I do now is not quite unsimilar to what you would do when you actually deal with real GHG. So, and this is a toy language. It doesn't really make much sense beyond the example that I needed for. Um, but there's like lambda and, and applications and variables, of course. And then I throw in the throw operation, so we can raise exceptions. And I throw in a catch accept operation to catch the exception. And then we also have a let construct. Um, so we have bindings in our language. We assume this to be lazy. And now the question is, given a program, can it throw? Or will all calls to throw be nicely caught? And so a simple program analysis. So this is the code we can start with. Um, I want to write this function, can the program throw? And I have a local recursive go here. And of course, um, the program that throws, throws. That's easy. The program that catches something, no matter what, what he is doing, that does not throw exceptions. Uh, catch. And then we can write the other cases. So for variable x, so I said the let is, is, is lazy. So depending, it kind of depends on where does x come from. So we have to, we can't just tell from the variable name itself whether it can throw or not. So we have to keep an environment around. This is a very typical idiom when you do program analysis. Uh, you remember for, for all variables whether they can throw or not when you actually look at them. Um, yeah, we have to initialize it. And then we can do the other cases. Um, lambda is not the interesting one, so I'll just say um, arguments will be strictly evaluated. So this will, um, we have to analyze the body with a new environment uh, where we said that x does not throw. Now it's called lamb, sorry. And then the if you have an application or any kind of operation that use has two arguments, then it throws if either of the two throw. Okay, so so far so good. Let's look at the let case. So clearly, because I said let is lazy, um, so we will not evaluate the argument until we actually need it. Um, so we need to evaluate we need to analyze, analyze E2, but of course not in, in that original environment, but we need to 
extend the environment with something with information about X. So the the, the new information from just this binding here that's Uh, that's x and x throws if the right-hand side throws. So we can now analyze E1, and then we build the new environment as... Okay, so straightforward. This is, again, like programming language research homework a little bit. Um, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Like, this is we're small enough to, to make sure. Oh, thanks. Um, you? This line? Uh, no, this is this is the look operator from map. This this should work. It it has the map on the left and the element on the right. Um, so here have some example programs. Uh, lambda yy just um, shouldn't throw. So yeah, that's false. Um, if I bind x to throw but don't use x, then this should not throw. So that works. And if I bind x. Uh, and I use X in the body, then that I should find that this can throw. So, so so far so good. This was just set up. Now let's make this interesting. Let's add recursive uh, let definition. So this let was non-recursive. Um, I was looking at the right hand side of of E1 in the outside environment. X is not in scope in its right hand side. So let's add the let rec. And um, it's a mutual let like just like in, in Haskell's internal core language. So we have a, a list of bindings, x, y, z, and so on, and they can all mention all the other x's and y's and z's. But let and let rec probably are quite similar, right? So let's see what happens. Um, so I have these bindings here. I have an updated environment. And then I update it with the information that um, Like this, okay. This, I'm just cargo calling what I wrote for let. It type checks, so let's see what happens. Um, I, I have a bunch of examples here that I can comment out now. Um, so example three, well, I have a let rec. It binds x to throw, but it's actually not recursive. And this works. So it, it finds out that but the body refers to x, x can throw, so this is fine. So in example three, we actually have a recursive x, so it calls itself, think of a recursive function, but it can also throw. Um, and I get an exception that something's not in scope. Okay, so type checked, but I still made bugs. This can happen. What's the bug? It's, it's on this line. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm passing the wrong environment here. It's recursive, so I have to pass an environment that has that already mentions all these axes that I'm binding in the recursive group. Do I have such an environment? Nth prime, correct. So I just pass on nth prime. And that are. Oh. Um, still doesn't work. So this is the correct code, just again Haskell being too stupid to make sense of it. Um, because we're tying the knot again. Oh, maybe I should show that this actually works in, for example, example three. So it, it's not like completely broken. It still makes sense. But now we are tying knot again. The, the environment that contains the analysis information for the variables in the current group is defined with something that requires that information. So in that sense, it's quite similar to the graph structure before. Yeah? Yes. Um, any ideas what it is? Time to keep everybody awake after the pizza. Yeah? The union? No, it's not the union. The map data structure is, is again, not the problem. 
it's actually the boolean. This boolean here, because if you if you would step through the program like I did before, you would find that in for this program here, I am I'm, I'm basically writing let x equals x and true. So uh, let x equals x and true. This is what this whole thing reduces to, given our definition for how app works and the map go away and everything. And that surprisingly does not work. Uh, I mean and in this. Oh, I mean or, thanks. Still doesn't work. Okay, so the problem is, um, is the booleans. Um, and again, my library provides a, something that looks like the booleans. It has all the operations that you, maybe not all, but it has some operations that you might want. It will not have all. It will have, it could have all, but not, never mind. Um, and then, of course, this get operation to get to the normal boots. And if you plug this in, so let's use it. Um, oh, sorry. And we want to use it. So let's create a copy. So we want to pass down one of these um, recursive pools here. And we want to return one of these. So at the end, we have to um, get them out. And then, of course, we have to use the operations that I just shown. So not false, but. Um, like the false function, the true function, uh, and here. And that's it already. Very, very small refactoring because it's the same API. It doesn't really change the way we program. But if I reload and I run example three, it works. Okay, I, I tried to trick you by using example three rather than example four, and you're telling me I'm using the old code. So I, I'm, I guess we. No, no, okay. So this is the interesting one, example four. <laughs> Um, so now it, it works. And, and for example 5, for example, uh, this is one where, which is recursive, but there's no throw. Um, it also works. And maybe since we have this already here, uh, I can now show you that what I'm really just showing is that this works. So the recursive definition can make sense. Uh, yes, please. No, no, this is not about short circuiting. Oh, then you get a typed arrow. These are different types. Oh, this will work, yes, yeah. It's no, it's not the parallel or. It is really finding a fixed point to the equation, which is, I think, something else. Um, but maybe, or maybe we can, maybe we can move this to the end, um, because this is, I mean, in a way, this is not just booleans, also sets and other things. So, and there it's not really short circuiting. But maybe this will become clearer when we look at how this actually works. So, in a way, this is like the user-facing end of the talk. You, there's the API. You can use it. It does the things you were hoping it would work, um, and, and it's more declarative. But I think you're probably curious what happens underneath. Um, and I'm going to break down the problem um, for just these two functions. Let's focus on sets, the insert uh, function, and, um, and, of course, the get operation. And we can break it down into two two layers. 
there's the imperative layer, which deals with writing down the set of equations you want to describe your solution with, and then declaring the relationships between them and solving that. And then the question, how do we take that and turn it into the very nice pure API that we've seen? Um, could you close that window, please? Thanks. Um, and I'm going to simplify it a little bit for today. Um, so let's see. So for the imperative version, can we come up with an API that has does the following thing? So I can declare something to be a, like a, a, a storage cell for a set. I can declare that the thing in a particular cell should be the thing in another cell plus a new element. Um, and then I can get the element out. And th by separating the declaration from the definition of something, I can now take something that I'd like to think of as recursive and implement it in like an imperative style. That, that's what you do in, in like old style C. You first declare all the functions you want to use, and then you get to define them. And this is how you go from recursive and lazy to imperative and, and, um, and non-recursive. So this is an API I could imagine to solve the problems that we've seen, but I would have to write my whole program in I.O. And that's actually what I did in, in OCaml, which was the motivation for the whole thing. Um, so we can look at how to implement this. I think this is a simple programming exercise. I will maybe just go through it very quickly, but there's not much surprising there. Um, a cell contains a set and, may, and also a list of things that, are, that want to be notified if that thing changes. Um, the cell is initially empty. And when I say that a cell should be X inserted into another cell, um, I have an update function that propagates information from this cell to this cell. So it reads the, it reads the cell, it calculates the new value, it also compares it with the old value. If the value hasn't, has changed, then we write the new value to that cell, and we also tell everybody else who wanted to know that, um, kind of like, that it depend on this value to update themselves. Uh, and I, I run this update thing at least once. I also make sure that it gets run whenever this thing changes, and that's it. There's a very simple fixed point iterator solver. So I, I can now describe uh, a graph between many of these set things and how they relate to each other using insert. Um, and and once, once I run all these functions on all the relations I declared, I can read off the value and it will be there. And good so far. The interesting part is how to take this I.O. thing and make it pure. Because this is the API we want. We want uh, a, a value, a type R set. We want a pure function that looks like the one from the pure set API, and then a way of converting them to the normal API, normal set thing. And of course, in order to do that, we have something with I.O. We want something without I.O. Everybody in that room over there learns that this is not possible. People in this room know that there's unsafe perform I.O. Um, right. And, and of course, it's dangerous, unsafe, and so on. Um, but I don't know. That doesn't stop me. So how can we do this? Um, so the insert function creates a new cell. Uh, it, of course, use unsafe perform I.O. It creates a new cell. It's the thing with returns. This is important. And then it does something with the other argument. And remember that we had, when we looked at the recursive equation, we said it's important to be for something to be lazy so that you can actually have recursive equations. So insert has to be lazy in R2. We can't just look at R2 right away because it will prevent us from making any progress with recursive equations. So the code that actually looks at R2 is hidden in this thing called later, which basically takes this code and runs it down here. But until this is happening, we're not actually looking at R2. This is one of the tricks to, to make this work. Uh, I'll show you later and do know on the next slide, um, but they do what, what they say. And then here I insert this, um, I, I, make, I declare the relationship between C1 and C2, which are now by now both available as cells to in the underlying I.O. library. And I also make sure that I, I run these actions associated with the other cell, or rather the other R set value. So insert itself doesn't actually run this thing, just gives me the cell 
and remembers that I should do these things before I get to use it really. So when I actually want to read the value finally, that's when I, sorry for the, having something on the very last line of the slides, that's when I run this thing and it also runs all the other things in that current graph of related things and then I can get the value. At, at this um, later and do now is basically just an IO action together with a marker whether I've done it so that I only run it once. And it's, it's what you would expect to do. It's crucial that you mark it as done before you actually run it, so that when it's recursive and it tries to run itself again, it will only run, still only run once. So this is the, there's a crucial idea here about how to handle the recursiveness. And these three slides together allow you to implement the set library thing that we saw and that enabled our, our code there. Um, I simplified it a little bit. So we, we've seen different types. You can actually mix them. So you have the, like the member function goes from set to bool. Um, so that requires a little bit better structuring of the code. And then, of course, things become very complicated once you wonder, is this actually thread safe? Because now you have multiple threads exploring the graph and things. There's a great library called Deja Vu uh, for testing recursive programs. Oh, sorry, concurrent programs. So if you're writing code with MVARs and stuff, and you're not sure if it's thread safe, look at that library. It's really great because it explores all possible schedulings. And, and it's very mean because it, you learn that the code you think is good is actually not good. Um, and and there are, of course, these, these things that watch for changes, that's kind of a source for space leaks. So you have to get rid of them and you don't longer need them. Um, this is all doable, but not very interesting for this talk. Um, and that's how you can implement the thing. Now the question becomes a little bit, what can you do with this? And there are some equations that you could expect to have a solution. Like the one, this is the one we just looked in GHGI more or less. Um, as I said, that's 24 inserted itself that has a solution that's kind of clear. Um, but then there are things like B equals not B, where you don't, wouldn't expect this to have a solution, right? Because if it's true, then it's false. If it's false, then it's true, and that, that, that's not good. Um, so the question is, which of these functions should I provide in my library? And the answer is, all those that are monotone. And, and I'm, I'll skip the slide with the, with the um, LaTeX uh, math, really. But the idea is that you, you, you kind of order all the values in the types. So for the sets, it's simple um, set inclusion. For Boolean, I just pick the order that false is less less useful than true, or, or less has less information than true. And then the functions that I provide in my API are precisely those that are monotone with regard to this relation. So if, if, I learn some, if I learn more about a set, then the result of the function should also tell me more about the result. And with that condition, um, there, there exists a fixed point um, or, and, or a, a solution to the recursive equation, to put it this way. And, um, what I, um, so this is why you find uh, these functions, for example, like for, for sets that insert, delete, union, and section member, they are all good. Um, but you won't find difference or not, because this will, equations written with that, they may not have a solution. Yes? Uh, no, no, this is the one. You can have a, the constant function, like for example, one, uh, the, yeah, the, the constant function, which ignores its argument and always returns set, the set containing 42, that's a perfectly monotone function. So you allow equality here. And I guess you could write less, strictly less here and get the same statement because if they are equal, then by virtue of being a pure language, they are equal as well. So yeah, you could make it strict inequality here and get the same meaning, but you really want that one here. Uh, yes? I guess, I guess, what you, if I may rephrase, you're saying you can drop this requirement, it will lead to some programs just not terminating because they keep trying to find a fixed point. So, like, 
with B not B, it will just loop because it will try will try uh, true and false and true and false and so on. Um, but if it comes to a solution, it will be a, a valid solution, right? Yeah. Um, not quite, because, and this is a good, good transition to, to the last slide, is this still Haskell? If, if we drop the Montessori requirement, I think it can be cases where, depending on which order you do this kind of solving propagation, which may depend on what, you look for, what value in a graph you look at first, you might get one of two different solutions. And that would be bad, because we really want Haskell functions to, given the same input, always give the same output, no matter in which order you evaluate the components of the results or something. So that, that's why I think the monophysy requirement shouldn't be dropped easily. Um, right, so, so yeah, this was the implementation. Um, there's a bit more tricks on, in the actual code on, on Hackert if you want to look at it. And now we can go to the like philosophical section of this talk, namely, is this something we really want as part of a Haskell library that claims to have a, the types that we see? And um, I, I used unsafe performio, and that always should make you crazy. Like this is okay. And this is a quote from the paper that introduced unsafe performio, and it, it explained why it's called unsafe but not wrong. It is not necessarily wrong to use unsafe performio. It merely means that it's no longer the compiler guaranteeing all the nice things about Haskell, like doesn't crash, has type safety, memory safety, uh, is pure and, and so on. But now it becomes your obligation to prove that, or at least to convince somebody that this is the case. So let's see, what do we expect from Haskell? Well, we expect type safety. So it doesn't, this implies memory safety. It doesn't just crash, it doesn't override random memory. A bool looks like a bool. And I, I claim that this is the case for the library that I wrote. It doesn't break the type system. Um, and then I guess purity could be phrased differently. It could be said, uh, it wouldn't matter how, in which order I evaluate things. It doesn't, if I have a pair, it shouldn't matter whether I print the first or the second element first. That, that evaluation order shouldn't affect the result. And I believe this is also the case, as long as we have monotone functions. Uh, there's a little catch which I look, discovered like this week. If not, not with the functions we have defined so far, they are all fine. But if you, if you extend the API a bit more to more interesting structures of things, you can possibly have the case that it, depending on how order, which order you do the solving, you either run in an infinite loop or you kind of jump ahead and, and get to a solution. So this is something we have to, we have to look at clo more closely when this can happen. But I think at least with the current API, this can't happen. Because with the current API, you always have a finite number of steps until you will reach a solution. And then, of course, most importantly, maybe equational reasoning. So when, when we have that x equals something, um, one moment, when x equals something, then I can take any occurrence of x and replace it with that something and get the same meaning. This is, this is like really the core of what purity gives us. And certainly, we don't want to lose that. And I claim we don't lose that. Just like we don't lose, for example, this transformation. I can take a, a binding and I can duplicate it. And maybe even take a recursive binding and co make two copies that are the same, just that they're calling each other. And this shouldn't affect the program. And the reason this doesn't affect the program is that my library gives you, f gives you fixed points, gives you solutions to the equations. And from a solution of the equation, you can't tell, for example, how many redundant equations there were. It will not give you, for example, a way of tell me how many variables were involved in that equation. That would be an example for something that we certainly don't want to see in this pure API. So this is promising. This looks good. Um, I'm, I'm feeling reasonable confident about it. There is stuff that kind of breaks. And now it becomes really the question, like, is this, is this a problem? Or how big is the problem? For example, there exists a transformation called the static argument transformation. If you have a function and all calls to the function have the same uh, argument, maybe 42, including all the recursive ones, and you can just remove that argument and, it, and the function becomes has one less argument less. Or if the function doesn't have any arguments, it just becomes a normal value definition. And we can also go the other way around in Haskell. So in, in normal Haskell, if you're not using my library, that, 
this transformation should not change the meaning of your program, where you take some binding, maybe recursive, and you just make it a function taking the unit argument. This my library, this will change the meaning of the program. We'll go from something that has a, has a value to something that will run into an infinite loop. And that may not be so nice. As a defense, I can claim that these are precisely those kind of transformations that break sharing. So if you remember at the very beginning of the talk, like the FIPS example, and the, um, that only works so nicely and efficiently because the recursive calls to Fibonacci list are actually using the same list. So you're not actually recomputing everything. And if we do that transformation to that example, so if it becomes a function taking a unit argument, uh, what will happen is that you break the sharing, you will recompute the Fibonacci list in every recursive call, the complexity, both time and space of your program explodes. And because it explodes the, the complexity of your program, a compiler will be very careful not to do this thing, which makes me a little bit hopeful that I, I can have a library where this transformation is bad and the compiler will not just mess around with it. But it still puts an onus on the, on the programmer to, to keep these things in mind and don't just apply a simple transformation like this and expect it to work. But this is the same level of sophistication as when you make tricks with laziness and not time. So maybe it's still okay. And if you have an agreement on what is Haskell, it's unclear. Like there's not a list of things I can check off that is official. And even if I had it, it's kind of unclear from a mathematical point of view, how would I, for example, prove that my program using unsafe perform IO is actually safe? What is the proof mechanism? This is like an advanced research question in a way, um, but I'm, I'm curious about that question as well. So I, I cut somebody off uh, because I wanted to finish the slide, so. It, it should be true of everything you can build with it. So the, my library only exposes monotone functions. And then there's a nice theory that says that function composition of monotone functions is monotone. Um, and all the things you can do in like Haskell um, will keep them monotone. I, I should maybe point out that the get function is very much non-monotone. So if you use the get function within, like if you take the, the R bool and turn it into bool, and then use if then else on that, somewhere in the equations for your R bools, then you, it'll just not terminate. It'll become, uh, and again, it is, it's, then it'll be like a strict uh, equation again. Um, no, no. The, 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 so the, these, these modules provide a safe API, I, I claim. And of course, if you then go to the internal libraries that are beneath that implemented, then there are many things you have to take care of. But um, I, I claim that just these useful libraries should be safe. And I, we could even, well, yeah, safe. It's, so you have to be careful to make this not tying correctly. Otherwise, if you, like if you don't, if you don't have the kind of sharing that we need for this to work, then it'll just not terminate, but at least it'll not break things too badly. All right. Um, yeah, summary, a uh, high-level takeaway, independent of my experiment here, is that what laziness really brings us to, uh, as Haskell developers, is the ability to write recursive equations very elegantly. It's like an embedded DSL for recursive equations. And, and that's an interesting uh, observation, I think, at least for me it was. And then my claim is, this is nice and useful. Let's just allow it for more things, Boolean sets, maybe other data structures. Um, maybe. This, um, uh, probability distributions. So I'm, I'm wondering if we can define a data recursive distribution that if you use that instead of your monad and use the memo try and you have a finite space, state space but, but circles, you can actually get the solution. So this would be an interesting puzzle to, to think about. Uh, like what are the other data types we, we can fit in this model? The open question um, is, is this pure? Is this something we want? Is this still Haskell? Um, and then I mentioned some problems, like we didn't talk about how to make these implementation problems um, 
better. There's something a bit annoying um, if you write let x, x equals x, even if it's type r bool. I don't have any way of like getting my functions in between uh, before GHG runs into a circle, so this will not work. And this is kind of something where in the... Oh, where is it? In, in this code with the let rec, um, I, sh I should do something here to avoid having a, a d x equals x after resolving all the other things. Um, but it's possible. It's just a little little th thing you have to take care of when you use the library. Um, and then, of course, there's a bunch of work you can do about making these propagator libraries, the, the I.O. stuff, much more efficient. Less updates, only transferring deltas. Uh, that's like a whole rabbit hole that I'm staying, trying to stay out of because really the message here is this can we have more recursive de equations in Haskell. So with that, um, I thank you all for your attention and uh, maybe have a few more questions now. Yeah, first of all, give an applause to, uh, to Joachim. Uh, are there... Again, yes. <laughs> I'll take all the posts you can give me. Uh, are, there, are there any questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I want to uh, get more like, what do we mean by uh, how, how to prove? Uh, yeah. How to prove uh, this, is, uh, this is pure. Like, concretely, what do we have to prove here? Like, why couldn't it be not pure? Like, Maybe I'm I'm not really the expert on no, no, it's a good how question. to define okay. pure what, things. What, what can go wrong is a good question. Um, so, um, well, I guess one. Let's say we included a function that is not monotone, like not. Then our program, well, I guess that would still be pure. Uh, what what would be not pure? Maybe we made a bug in our um, implementation of the like propagator network. And oh yeah, here's here's one thing. Right, like the the code that we written that that is is buggy, of course. Once we have multiple threads, so um, this thing here, because um, if if multiple threads, you can maybe read a value, um, and uh, I don't have to uh, yeah. The, I won't give you the precise example, but it can happen that depending on which order you read the things off while they're um, propagating information, you may read a value, think it's already done, but it is not actually done. So th that's one thing that can go wrong. And it could mean that you're using my library and you're seeing a value that is not a solution to the equations. And that may depend on like what you see, may depend on in which order you evaluate things. That would be not true. So I would expect a proof to, if I had that bug, to tell me, oh, well, I would expect the proof to fail. Um, does that roughly answer the question? Um, well, if it just, yeah, this is a, a threat safety problem. This ha can happen also when it's they're monotone. Um, in, with non-monotone functions, what can go wrong? I, I guess with non-monotone functions, it could be that they're, for example, for sets, that they're, that both the set containing one and the set containing two is a solution. And depending on what you do first, you get one or the other. Uh, that's very much non-pure. So again, that, that would be a, something where it could break. Next question, yes. Uh, would it be possible to do something like this for integers, for monotonicity over like increasing? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, I, I thought I, I was about to like write uh, a module that has both the increasing and decreasing order. So maybe I should mention that, that for, for Booleans, for example, I said false is less than true. But also maybe true should be less than false. Um, depending on your application, you want one or the other. So that's why I'm actually providing two modules with two different data types that both have the bool API, but they give you like this one prefers false and this one prefers true. So for numbers, you could both want the greatest solution or you could want the least solution. We would have two modules or two data types. Um, so what I need is 
um, a partial order. So numbers are ordered, that's fine. I need a bottom element, a least element. So if we take the order where we take the natural numbers ordered and we want the smallest solution, then that's fine. I can start with zero and I can run the propagation thing. Um, in that case, we have the smaller problem that there you can like have an infinite chain. If you just like, if you say x equals x plus one, plus one is a perfectly monotone function, but it will not find a solution. Um, but it will reliably not find a solution. It's just like non-termination. It's something that Haskellers are used to compared to like people writing Cork or Actor. Um, so that may be okay. Um, the reason why I then stop writing that module is because the modules start with a little small compelling example why it's useful. And I couldn't quite think of a good example yet. So um, maybe maybe I can find one. So this is for the increasing sequence. For the other one where we find the we want to find the greatest solution, we have to start with the largest element, and natural numbers don't have a largest element, but you would have we could have one for natural numbers plus infinity. Um, or even yeah, or even integers plus infinity, so maybe the like maybe of integer, and then you start with nothing. Um, you have to make sure your operations respect that. And with that, for example, you could implement a shortest graph, like shortest path in a graph algorithm in, in this way, I think. So we, yeah, we can add more things to the library. Uh, by the way, the, I, I added uh, the, a map instance, no, I shouldn't say instance, a map type. It's actually quite interesting because it um, it doesn't order the elements in the map, but it allows you to tie a knot again. Um, so you can use the R types inside the maps, to, or you can use Haskell data constructors inside the maps to like create cyclic data structures if, you, if, you, if you've done that before. Um, it's kind of cool. It's actually the, the, also the more useful one, but I'm still looking for a good example, like an application where this is useful. It fits the, the module. So if you have one, then um, please uh, send me a pull request. <laughs> Okay. Uh, in the same vein as the previous question, how would uh, how would we be able to define something that satisfies these equations with fun with data types that do not have a properly defined ordering, like graphs or complex numbers? Are there any like ideas to do that? Uh, you you probably for uh, like a specific use case, you probably have an ordering that is not like there might be multiple orderings on on real numbers. Um, and depending on what the use case is, maybe we can put it differently. Um, if you write these equations down, and there's a chance that they can have multiple solutions, like the set equations, insert s equals insert 3 into s that has many solutions, but the one we care about is the smallest one. And it, once you answer, pose yourself the question, what is the what characterizes the solution that I care about, you're probably already halfway towards finding the right um, order. And then if there are multiple orders for a given data type, we might have just to have multiple modules for, for the different orders. Okay, yeah, thank you for the for the talk. Uh, have you, um, so if I recognize it right, is it called like a semi-lattice or so, where you have like a um, a top element or a bottom element, and then you have a join operation it's, that uh, puts them together. Would it make sense to uh, have a type class or something for this? Um, I, I had one at an earlier version of this. Well, actually, I think it's is it still there? there. There's actually a type class for that. It's kind of interesting because it doesn't have a method for inequality because I never needed the runtime. I just need the partial order to exist. I need the functions to be monotone. But this is just all proof obligations. So if you were doing this in Acta, this would be a irrelevant code. What I do have is a function that checks equality, assuming they are partially ordered. And this is a nice optimization because for the sets, I mean, the naive code that I showed you, that just compare the sets, but that compares the elements. For, but if I only, if I know that one set is definitely equal or larger than the other set, larger than the subset equation, then it suffices to compare the sizes of the sets to know whether I'm actually found a fixed point or not. Um, so there's a type class there, which is used by um, by this naive propagator module, which is less naive than the one on slides, but still naive. And this works for every partial order. 
for the booleans, I actually have a have a, um, a, a bespoke propagator that is optimized for booleans because once a boolean, like a boolean, can only change once. It's false. At some point, it may become true. It can tell everybody else, "No, I'm true," but then it can, for example, drop the the, um, the connections to everything else watching it. Uh, so my library is set up so that you can have different implementations for different data types and still have a way of implementing, for example, the, um, where is it? The member function, which mixes sets and bools. So this is, um, this is possible here. Yeah. And oh, I forgot the question, but maybe it was answered. <laughs> Um, I had a question. So you uh, discussed earlier the integers, but the int integers don't have like a smallest element. So you would. I would, I would use naturals for that one, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, but maybe it was maybe in yeah. inaccurate. And I actually just thought of an example that I think I've stumbled across in the past is a uh, definition from uh, there's one exercise in Gödel Escherbach, which actually is about defining um, uh, the. It's like the sequence of integer uh, of natural numbers that's defined as the figure and ground via yeah, the figure and ground of the figure itself. And I think there was something about it where I was thinking that like if I could tell GHCI that like the numbers are increasing, then it wouldn't then I wouldn't need to give it an extra element. So I I, I think I will maybe look into mm -hmm. this and see if this could be an example for, okay, for cool. natural numbers. All right. Um Let's maybe do one more question uh, because then okay. the next talk is already uh, in line quite soon. Um, so, okay. have you tried doing this completely without I/O? So, um, um, that's a very good question. Uh, I gave a lightning talk at ICFP about this idea, and the question was like, "You, you say it's not possible in pure code, but do you know it's not possible?" And I was like, "Oh, I didn't even think about that." Um, so, I guess that is the question, right? To be, to be, um, and I, one argument why I think it's not possible is precisely that, and maybe this needs to be proven, that this is an equivalent, if I only use pure Haskell, this is an equality or an equivalence between equivalent programs. But I, I don't see a way of, solving these kinds of equations, given that, like, what I know about how functions work in, in Haskell, because you, you will just call a new function every time, and, and then the b equals two or b thing will just unroll infinitely, and you somehow have to recognize that. Uh, whereas here I can do it. So if I could do it in pure code, then this would be, this would be preserved, even for the examples that we, we see. And I don't think that's possible, but maybe I'm just kicking the can down the road. Um, and maybe there's a different argument why this is just not possible in pure code with the semantics that we want it to be. But having a better concise argument for that would also be interesting. So if somebody has an idea, uh, let me know. All right. Thank you very much, Joachim. One more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.